All right. I'm here with Scott Caesar, the Director of Cloud Research and Development of Highland Software. Yep. Is that correct? That's and right. uh, and so, yeah, long titles. Everyone has a long title. I'm bad at long titles. The tell longer me, the better. Tell me about your long title <laughs> and what it entails. So um, I have been with Highland for um, coming up on 14 years, actually. And I started off as a entry-level developer and have worked up to where I'm at today through our management staff. And now I am the Director of Cloud Research and Development. So I focus on our um, cloud architected solutions. We're actually a fairly old company or been around for a while, 25 years. And so a lot of our um, software from like the 90s and early 2000s was on premise, um, delivered there. And so I've helped transform us into a more cloud oriented um, software system with SaaS products. Um, so that's one of my core roles. Um, we have a product that I run called ShareBase, which is a enterprise file sync and share solution, which is similar to Box or Dropbox. You've probably mm -hmm. used yeah. those, but it's built specifically for businesses where we have our own private cloud where we'll store your content. So I focus on that. And then I'm also involved in our emerging technologies um, and driving a lot of that forward. Um, through what we have is called Highland Labs, which is our innovation center of excellence. So that's kind of how I participate in a lot of these these buzzwords you have yeah, up here. Buzzwords are wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love them. I love them, and I research into them, and I try to make them less buzzy and more uh, reality based. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So I've been doing that for a while, and the long title has served me well. Absolutely, and, and Highlands obviously in in the Cleveland area, the mm -hmm. tech juggernaut of um, yep. of of grabbing people and tech culture. You guys, yeah. I remember, you know, twelve years ago, it was like one. Of, it was known for its its culture and people coming yeah. in and, and really trying to foster that. And now you have what a thousand buildings? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have thousands of employees. So, like yeah. I said, I've been with Highland for about fourteen years, yeah. and it's been exploding since I've joined. Uh, we're based out of Westlake, which is about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes west of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, and when I joined, we were about 400 people. Uh, you know, I, it was my first job right out of college. I'm a grad from the University of Michigan in their computer science program and actually moved to uh, the Cleveland area for the job. And we do have a great culture. Uh, we have an indoor uh, twisty slide that goes from the uh, second floor to the first floor in one of our buildings, um, and that's where I originally started working. But uh, in the slide, yeah, in the slide, <laughs> definitely <laughs> just set up shop, brought yeah. my laptop right into the slide. Uh, but so we had that one building in Westlake to start, and then we've actually started expanding into a campus structure. So we have three different buildings, and I'm now transitioned into our tech building that has a lot of really great kind of culture building things. We have an indoor uh, volleyball court. We have a half court basketball court um, we do also do work but yeah a lot but of a lot of fun stuff um, and that's actually um, one of the reasons I even wanted to be on this podcast is kind of promoting Highland is a great place to work we're always growing um, we started at 400 when I joined and now we're getting close to 4,000 employees and we continue to expand and grow and we're definitely pushing more international um, and are those 4,000 employees mostly in Cleveland no actually I think there's maybe 1,800 to 2,000. So in, close to but, half. Yeah, close yeah. to half in Westlake, but then we have offices on the West Coast and around um, the United States. We have an office in Calcutta. We have people working out of London and all over the world. So yeah. we're, we're fairly spread now, um, and we're hoping to continue to spread and grow into the future. Absolutely. And for anyone that lives in uh, uh, San Jose or Silicon Valley and doesn't isn't surprised by the whole slide in volleyball court, very rare for the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's it's pretty much Highlands it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we're, we're really proud of yeah. our culture. We continue to get recognized as, you know, one of the best places to work in the country. Um, and so it's one of the things that we use to draw people in, uh, but it's really about the people that are there. We all are passionate. Um, you know, like I was saying, I progressed from uh, entry level developer to this long title of director of cloud research and development. So we do a lot of internal promotions and really try to let people reach their full potential. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a great experience for me for sure, and Highland's been great. 
As far as um, like describing Highland, maybe even somebody that's not technical, do mm -hmm. you usually just say it's a software company or a medical no. software company? <laughs> yeah. So we are, uh, we're in the industry of content services, which um, is basically cloud or on-premise services to help you manage your data and business processes. Um, so we do things like workflow automation. So if you have some business process that you're trying to digitize and automate, we do that. We have um, case management solutions, so in ticketing systems. We do um, capture solutions, so if you have documents that you want to scan in and ingest, we can use um, you know, some AI algorithms to categorize those documents, put them into different processes, um, recognize the metadata on those documents to push them through processes. Um, so our real core is automating businesses and helping them realize value quickly, um, maintaining their records, um, giving them access to the content they have in ways that help them perform better. Sure. And, and to that point, when you're looking at um, the landscape of emerging technologies, what, are yeah. you, what do you spend the most time researching today? And maybe what did you spend the most time researching la this time last year? Okay, so it's kind of the same thing yeah. for me personally, mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're spread very, um, we're, we're in all the different kind of emerging technologies. The core of our business is really going through a digital transformation to push us into cloud architected software. So we've been focused on that for, I don't know, seven, eight years. I've been researching it myself personally since 2011, um, you know, and that's different than on-premise software. But as we're kind of moving past uh, cloud and, and SaaS, you know, we have companies like Salesforce and Workday that have really driven that market forward. Um, so we know that's there. And now we're starting to research into blockchain and how that can impact our content and making sure that we have that auditability and transparency um, and accessibility across multiple institutions. We're actually looking into um, Internet of Things and managing that type of data. We've been doing some exploratory research in augmented reality, um, obviously AI and machine learning and just data analytics is a thing we're continuing to push towards. Um, but over the past year, so we actually started really getting serious about blockchain, which you know we see crypto up here, and that blockchain is definitely the backing technology for that. We got very interested in that um, probably two to three years ago, and we took a prototype solution that came through one of our hackathon type events, our internal hackathon event. Um, we had somebody propose a, a blockchain solution, and actually last year we took that uh, prototype demo to the Blockland conference mm -hmm. and started kind of showing it off and telling people like what, what we were thinking about, um, how blockchain could augment our content services platform. And so over the past year, we, you know, been building out that solution. Um, and I could talk a little bit about some of the different use cases. Go into it, yeah, I'm yeah, interested. So, um, like I said, it started off as a, um, a hackathon project. There's one of our solution architects, Scott York, I'll just name him right here. He's kind of my, my partner in a lot of this research and development. Um, he proposed a solution that was leveraging uh, a backend blockchain network to uh, manage the automatic creation of warrants for people that were out of compliance with parole. And there was like open systems that could do this. And that was just kind of a starting point. And it made us interested um, just because it's something we hadn't heard of before. So we took that out to the Blockland conference last year and started talking about it. And out there, we started to meet a lot of different people. Um, and, and the conference, if you guys aren't aware of it, is uh, really about bringing all these different like knowledge experts in the space together to talk for you know a few, a few days, um, which is more difficult than you might think because it's all around the world. So we, we bring them in. And we started talking with physicians. One of our core um, vertical markets is the healthcare market. And so we started talking about what our platform was capable of doing with blockchain um, through this you know, kind of creation of the, the warrants like in this prototype. And people were like, oh, could we use that for physician credentialing or the release of information from a hospital or um, you know, even patient records and giving the ownership of records 
back to the patients, because technically speaking, you own your own. Uh, your Potentially, yeah. Well, you're supposed to, but yeah. you have to access <laughs> them through the storage mechanisms of your, your healthcare provider. And so from there, with those discussions, we, we got really interested because that, like I said, was our core vertical. This was just a prototype idea. And so we started digging a little bit deeper and we ended up going to a different conference. It's the HIMSS conference, HIMSS 19, had, which is a major healthcare conference. And so we took um, a new prototype there that was based around the opioid distribution. So um, kind of, we, we were just trying to get people to talk with us and get an understanding of what people are interested in. So we built a prototype solution that would manage the supply chain of uh, schedule two or schedule one substances, specifically opioids. There's mm -hmm. an opioids crisis going on, and we thought, okay, this is an interesting thing we might be able to to work towards. And this was managing the process of, you know, a patient getting uh, the prescription from the doctor, being able to take that to a pharmacy, um, and getting that filled, and you know, passing it through the insurance, um, and and creating a lot more visibility on on that model of the, the distribution from patient or from doctor through patient and pharmacy, tracking that whole process through blockchain, um, which is an important thing. People are you know being over prescribed this thing, uh, these opioids, and it's causing people um, you know a lot of harm in their lives. So in driving that discussion forward, we found at the blockchain symposium at this conference that, okay, we're really, we're really onto something. Like people are interested in using the single source of truth um, that blockchain networks kind of provide and that peer-to-peer um, -peer trust that they also provide between these different constituents in a process like, you know, the insurance and the hospital or doctor providing it. Um, and we've just kind of continued from there um, over the past year um, with more and more use cases um, kind of being identified that where your data in transport moving between different organizations, there's a lot of like auditing and trust that has to happen there and blockchain can actually help um, with supporting that type of model, making it easier to know what's happening, who's touching that data, who's transacting on that data in a way that you know nobody can really change it or lie about it you'll know what's happened similar to bitcoin when you, you pass sure, bitcoin yeah, between yeah. people you know that's happened because of this consensus um, provided by the network effect and so we've been we've been pushing that and and through our research we actually started adopting um, the hyperledger fabric stack which was originally created by ibm and is now um, hosted by the linux foundation as an open source um, tool for creating permission-based blockchains. So there's this concept of permission versus public blockchain. So Ethereum, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. very um, you know relevant examples of public blockchains. But there's this other thought of the permission blockchain where you know the the actors on the system. We well, you know the nodes, right? You know yeah. the nodes, and you know who's running those nodes. And in the context of our business software, we do know our customers. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is leverage this type of technology to help our different constituents from different organizations actually transact quicker together without needing to, you know, export the whatever the content might be and then re-ingest it. Instead, their systems could communicate through a blockchain network. So um, we've just continued to, to research and push that. I'm happy to say we have definitely proven that our, our core technologies part, pair very well with interacting with the blockchain network. So going back to what I was saying earlier, um, you know, we have a workflow engine and that workflow engine can be used to trigger smart contracts to like read or write data and do different things on a blockchain network. And we also have our um, case management solution we call a work view um, that can be used to like generate the, um, the actual metadata in the format of what type of data you want to actually put into a block in a blockchain. And then ShareBase, which is our cloud storage solution, excuse me, um, can actually be used to store the physical content that we have associated with the metadata on the blockchain. Um, so one of the problems we've identified as we've researched this is that with blockchain technology in general, you can't store 
everything on the chain. You really should only be storing transactional data or metadata, small things, not an image in or a full yeah. document, right. right? And instead you want to be storing just like maybe the hash of that document on the blockchain. And so we've, with all these different use cases we've explored, we've kind of boiled it down to, we know we want to be able to validate the, you know, the origin and that the, the content that you're storing is actually authentic from when you stored it. And this concept is referred to as off-chain storage. And we're starting to build out our platform to easily provide off-chain storage where you can validate content off-chain while storing the transactions and metadata associated with that content on-chain um, through a permission blockchain network um, using the Hyperledger fabric stack. Sure, so you're not using Ethereum. Those we're not using Ethereum, yeah. but that um, Hyperledger um, framework that I'm talking about actually yeah. would allow you to interact with Ethereum, I believe. Um, I'm not the actual engineer building it, sure. but from what I understand, that can happen. And you could, um, if you're interested and know a little bit about blockchain technology, it's like these side chains, these permissioned side chains could be rolled up and hashed and stored onto Ethereum. So you have kind of the best of both worlds, both the permission blockchain network, but then that's kind of backed up onto the public blockchain network like Ethereum. Right. So we're starting to research that. Um, I personally, you know, written an ERC-20 token for Ethereum. Those are the, that's the standard spec yep. for doing a token on, on Ethereum and the um, non-fungible tokens, I think they're called, like CryptoKitties, if you're aware yep. of those. I've, yep. yeah, I've, dabbled sure. in, in, I've dabbled in that yep. type of thing personally. Uh, I do think ultimately, you know, enterprises will be more interested in that type of public blockchain network, but is the technology still has to be faked and um, refined scalability issues. Um, we're thinking to kind of bring it to the masses, it's gonna take these permissioned sure. networks to start. How far do you think you are from having that product kind of launch into the into a market? So that's a very good question. Um, so we're at a stage where we're looking for partners to pilot these solutions. Um, and our strategy, and this is a strategy with cloud software in, in general, is to start very, very small, right? You don't want to end up building a full solution, like spending a year's, two years of time before you even get it out into your customer's hands and playing with it. Um, so I think we're, we're very close once we find the right partners that believe in the ROI of what our system can do. We're very close to being able to do that piece, right? Like deploy, let's say, the pilot solution and working with the customers to build that out further. Going into a production scale, hey, let's start selling this, let's really market that everybody should be doing this. That's hard to say because we don't have a customer on the network, but we're, we're ready yeah. to kind of start that process of what's called a minimum viable product, mm -hmm. and get that out there, and then start iterating towards a solution that could go to scale. I mean, I don't want to say a date, but you yeah. know, we're, we're moving very quickly. We went from inception of idea to many different use cases and prototype solutions within a year. So, Do you have an MVP that's that's ready? Yeah, we have we have a number of different um, prototype solutions, MVP, the specifically the off-chain storage, um, leveraging our product share base, like mm -hmm. that's pretty much there. We actually have sharing as a service already built and that is accessible. You can buy that um, from our company to embed or extend your own applications with sharing functionality. And we'll be extending that piece with this off-chain storage mechanism that you know writes to blockchain networks and then from there iterate into more robust solutions for whether it's you know this opioid supply chain management or um, physician credentialing or release of information that's yet to be determined but the the root level sharing is a service that's backed by blockchain we're very very close to that and we've actually already kind of released the piece that is not backed by blockchain, but you can use the sharing as a service. Okay. Does that make sense? That does make sense, yeah. So when you're targeting like an industry for this kind of product, is, is healthcare kind of the first thing you want to tackle? That seems to be your bread and butter. Yeah, so healthcare is definitely a very um, good space for us to enter. It is our core vertical. I think it's, you know, 50% of our revenue. I'm 
kind of generalizing these numbers. Sure. It's it's a lot. We we'll we, hold you to that number. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> sure <laughs> you will. So we have, uh, but we also serve you know finance and higher ed and, and these other industries. But we are very interested in the healthcare market. One of the the concerns is. One of the things, I guess, maybe it's not a concern, just a hurdle in the process of adoption is, you know, the laws associated with it. Um, and can a blockchain network be the certified single source of truth for some of these things? And as you might imagine, in the healthcare industry, that's a more difficult mm -hmm. thing to change. Um, and there's national laws that can cause issues with this. Like, for instance, I believe the way that, um, in don't hold me to this, but I'm sure you will. <laughs> the uh, like physician credentialing has to be done, um, and it could be certified by a blockchain network. But each different hospital needs to do their own physician credentialing, and those rules are different between states. And there's federal laws guiding these types of mm -hmm. these types of things. And so we'd be looking to change federal law to recognize this. That becomes more difficult. Yeah. So we're really looking for things that we could do within the state. Ohio um, is one of the, if not the only state that's accepting like Bitcoin for tax Taxes, purposes. Yeah. They're very engaged in some of the initiatives going on in you know, the area with emerging technologies and want to pursue that. So our hope is to partner with Ohio to do things that, are, that we can do here more easily at the state level, prove it out, and then expand further um, from there. But healthcare is definitely a key focus for us and we think that, um, or, at least I think, you know, healthcare has a lot of innovation ahead of it. <laughs> like right. it's, I don't want to say stagnated, but there hasn't been enough change with the adoption of technologies, whether it's blockchain, augmented reality. 3D printing is even hard 3D, to get approved. 3D yeah. printing, um, internet of things for managing yeah. equipment out there. Um, and it obviously needs to improve. So for sure, from a passion perspective, I want to help change that with technology as best I can and it, it, it fits into our business model to focus there but we're not we're definitely not pigeonholing ourselves into that sure. um, we're talking about solutions with we serve the higher ed market so universities um, talking with them about trying to do um, student transcripts um, when students transfer between institutions like how does that all work and can we be leveraging blockchain to help with that um, type of business process. So there's a lot going on. Well, yeah, and you touched on something that I was going to ask you with, um, so when, you, when you're when you stuck in the blockchain world for too long, especially with the crypto people too long within yeah. that group, you get you get kind of stuck in the minutia of mm -hmm. that like weird meta game of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a challenge because the belief for the blockchain community is everything should be transparent, and everyone should have access to everything at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, now in my cybersecurity life, it's the exact opposite. Yeah. And so you even have uh, California legislation that's pretty much canceling out any kind of healthcare blockchain projects yeah. that aren't on completely siloed private blockchains. Because, I mean, the, the main um, arguments can be boiled down to blockchain is Every, the, the ledger is immutable forever, mm -hmm. and GDPR and California yeah. and these other states are saying everyone should have the right to be forgotten. Yeah, and though you can't have both, yeah. it's not Reese's peanut butter cups when you mix them. So, uh, how do you view that when you're building a blockchain solution for healthcare? So first off, like kind of going back to what I said, permission blockchain networks. Right, this yeah. is exactly yeah. why we we think this way. Um, you could, in a permission blockchain network run by a consortium, you could shut it down if you right. wanted to, like. Not that, you know. But you'd have to shut down the whole ledger, yeah, wouldn't yes. you? Yeah. yeah, and I think there are solutions where you don't have to store everything on the chain. You could just be storing, like, the hash, if you will, that could be verified in other mechanisms and just kind of storing that content there. There's also, and again, I'm going to get a little bit out of my depth here, but, you know, zero-knowledge proofs, mm -hmm. um, ZK Snarks or something like that. Um, those may have some possibilities where people can not be sharing the full data, but know enough enough yeah. to There'd be able be to certify log. these types of things. The the forgetting of things, um, you could build that into a, a blockchain network to a certain degree. It's how do you, how do you want to allow that, especially in a private yeah. one? You not that you want to, but. Um, that's a that is a big concern, especially when you get into like patient information. Like you may not want to store that on the blockchain ever. Mm -hmm. Instead, you might want to have some type of consolidation thing that isn't identifiable from the patient record. 
um, but the patient could validate it um, and things like that. That is a hurdle that we'll have to, to get over. Um, so we'll, we'll find oh, for out. Sure. But there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely um, solutions out there, or at least things that seem like they can s help solve that, where you can get the benefits of blockchain, um, but not necessarily step on the toes of the new laws of forgetting people. Well, and they'll keep on. I mean, it, we don't know what the federal law is going to look like, right? Yeah. So that's how that's the other challenge. Yeah. And so it, when you're building these blockchain projects, uh, the last kind of question, because I'm, I'm fascinated by mm -hmm. the trying to tackle that because it's such yeah. a task. And I feel it's like huge. you could be like rolling your stone up the hill and just have it completely fall oh, down yeah. without any you yeah. know mistake of your own. When you're building a, a private blockchain project, mm -hmm. how do you decide to do that versus make a really secure database? Um, Without using blockchain yeah, technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, they're just different tools, right? So, a lot of people don't think about the databases being used in the background, and a lot of people won't be thinking about the blockchain, blockchain being... Yeah in the background, right? So I just think it's another tool in the toolbox. And in making that decision, um, one of the key questions I kind of think of is, is there a need for multiple parties that are kind of outside of the same system that would need to interact with each other and have some assumption of trust, right? Um, we can do shared databases, but that's gonna be centralized with no consensus mechanism validating what's in that database. Here's your database over here. Here's your database over there. They don't align. You mm -hmm. find that out five years later. Right. Who's right? Here's the problem. So there is an overhead with driving the consensus, or you know, or if you're not about proof of work, and a lot of these permission blockchain networks don't have to do the proof of work piece to it. You can use different consensus mechanisms. Um, but the idea is if there's multiple parties that don't typically trust each other, but they need to have that single source of truth that they can trust and know that, you know, everybody's agreed in real time, real time, every 10 minutes or whatever. Right, right, say, yeah. right? whatever your metrics whatever are. Whatever your metrics are. Yeah. Um, if you would need to certify that, you know, everybody's agreeing that this is the current state of something and you don't want centralized control over that information. So like the patient record that I own in the future, my patient record, my information. Well, I should own that. These other institutions need to use it and I wanna know that they're touching it. Me as a person, I'm not gonna have my database of my own patient record, right? I want to have that stored somewhere else that I'm accessing and controlling. Um, so kind of bringing it back to your question of how do you make this decision between database and blockchain? Um, I think we're still, and I think the industry is still kind of sorting that out currently. And one of the things that, you know, our kind of stance on it is we're not trying to apply blockchain for the buzzy reasons. We think that there's a real um, value there with this um, transparency between institutions that want to interact on the same, um, on that same data. But there should only be one source of the truth. Again, with transcripts, um, if your transcript for a university was on the blockchain and could be pulled, and then other institutions could see, oh yes, this is, in my case, Michigan, oh yeah. Sure. Michigan put Scott's transcript up on the blockchain and we just pulled it. You'd be able to see that they did that 14 years ago. And, mm -hmm. and yes, I'm pulling down And there's down value this. in that for yeah. sure. Yeah, so instead of like that institution calling <laughs> Michigan, hey, can you get that? Yeah. Thank you, pay and the money. Yeah, then you don't know so who else has seen yeah, that. And, and then there's just value in um, like speeding up those processes. In transport between institutions, that takes a fair amount of time. Like typically, it's not a system to, I mean, there are system to system integrations, like the B2B integrations, I'm mm -hmm. not gonna say there aren't. And we, we do a lot of that, yeah. we do a lot of that. Um, that's one of our core value propositions is tying all these systems together. Um, but blockchain networks allow you to do that in a new way, a different way that in certain cases can um, be more efficient just because of the time it takes to transport content from one institution to another institution and validate that's the right thing and then update their systems. And now are these two systems out of sync? Mm -hmm. Well, you enter need to the blockchain. That. Right, enter that's, the that's blockchain. a way to do that for sure. So it's, um, it's something that we're still learning ourselves, I'd say, but we we think there's some value. Like it's hard to say that there's you know, again, I'll, I kind of do this comparison between 
blockchain and databases. They're different tools that kind of serve a similar purpose. There's going to be yeah. some value in that tool. And we're coming from the perspective of like, where is that value versus trying to apply blockchain to everything. <laughs> and I think there was an iced tea company that changed their name to like blockchain iced tea. And it's like, no, yeah. that's not what we're doing. Well, the ICO boom, when that, yeah. when oh, that, yeah. when that was just sweeping over everything really, uh, I feel like did blockchain a disservice by making the whole industry seem fraudulent. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it definitely did. But I, I think there's, it also created visibility because when when that type of ramping up started to happen mm -hmm. businesses like even like highland had to kind of okay well what is this is this a buzz is this something that matters or not and i remember it was probably mid to late 2016 we had some intern as this was starting to ramp up like right at the beginning of the the buzz uh, we had some interns exploring um i think it was ethereum actually and they okay. came and presented back um to me and some of my colleagues and this was kind of the first time I was taking it seriously at all. And I remember them talking through like how blockchain networks work to a, a certain degree. And I was just like, this is crazy. Like, this is very interesting. Um, you know, as a computer scientist, it's like, okay, the double spend problem is solved through consensus yeah. and P2P networking. And it's like, okay, this is crazy. And I don't know that I understand it. Then I started getting my hands dirty because I needed to kind of figure that out. And I think that that, that buzz that made it like, oh, they're from an enterprise software or enterprise business perspective. It's like, if there's money to be made, we should be paying attention to, is this real or is this not real? So it drove us to take it more seriously. And then obviously market tanked out, but we weren't, we weren't in it for the buzz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were in it for the technology and the value it could add to our system. And we're not trying to be a, you know, the blockchain gurus, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to implement sharding on Ethereum and things like that. We're not gonna do You're that. You're not mining anything. We're gonna, we're gonna use these yeah. systems to extend the technologies that, our core technologies that we already have um, is kind of a value add, right? We're not gonna force blockchain on people. If there's a value for them to use it, we want to provide that value, and if there's not, then we have other solutions for you to use. Sure. To do different you business have practices. A body of 25 years of work to, to fall back yes, on, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's really an extension to the things we've already done as we continue to um, go through our own digital transformation. What was the team that was that is now kind of researching blockchain? What were they researching before? Our cloud software. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, some of the developers from ShareBase I'm just going to okay. keep plugging yeah. our, our products. That's fine. Um, so some of our developers that helped with our cloud architected solutions are involved. Um, you know, we get a lot of hackathon projects of just developers from all over our organization that are interested in this mm -hmm. technology so we can continue. Are, are these internal hackathons or are yes, they, they are the, part of something these are, else? These are okay. our internal, um, yeah. you know, globally for our global engineers and actually anybody you don't have to be a software developer to participate mm -hmm. in our internal we call it we actually call it an innovation challenge you don't actually have to okay. technically yeah. build it so it's not really a hackathon but a lot of people just call it hackathon yeah that's, well, that's a lot what, of people yeah. build things and sure. hack it together but we want to be more inclusive than that because mm -hmm. the ideas can come from anybody um, so the the people that were involved were um, our cloud engineers if you will and then, like I said, this um, Scott York, I'll name him again, yeah. he'll like that, uh, our uh, solution architect who does a lot of customer engagement. So he works with a lot of different industries, um, a lot of um, product knowledge, a lot of um, solution knowledge in the different, you know, in healthcare, in the universities. So um, really coming from that, we want to solve the problem. We're not trying to apply blockchain. Yeah. What are problems that we couldn't solve before? Now can we because of this emerging technology? If the answer is yes, that's we'll where we're it, headed. Yeah. If the answer is no, great. We have other tools for different reasons. And I'm pretty um, excited to say I think there is a very significant value to extending content services platforms with blockchain networks, permissioned or otherwise. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating uh, seeing some of the use cases come out because I, for a while, was of the belief that private blockchains were just not 
useful at all. And I think that many private blockchain ideas are not useful for sure. I think that's kind of what would again kind of discredited that yeah. you know niche. But um, but yeah, I'm interested in also what you're doing with augmented reality. I know that's yeah. a hard shift. Yeah, but like, no, no, it's hard like shift. Like ev everyone, everyone does AI. Like I can kind of guess what you're doing with AI. I can kind of guess yeah. what you're doing with cloud. But augmented reality is new, yeah. sexy, and unusual. What's yeah. Highland doing with it? Yeah, so. For the most part, like we're not trying to bring an augmented reality solution to market currently. Yeah. It's really, um, so we do a lot of usability studies yeah. and user experience studies. And with um, a technology like augmented reality, having holograms that seemingly are in your room with you, um, we want to understand how people interact with them, right? We do think that it'll be, um, something in the future, specifically in the healthcare industry, when doctors need to scrub in and they can't touch anything, but they still need some information. Like, how can we get that into their field of view? Um, things like that. And how can we serve up our content through an augmented reality headset in a natural way so that people can be reviewing documentation or having the heads up display of different metrics associated with the surgery or, or something like that. Um, so a lot of our exploration is just like, how do people interact with this technology? And we've done a couple different prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of headset are you using right we're now? We're using the HoloLens. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So we're using pretty much from an augmented reality perspective, we're only using the, the HoloLens mm -hmm. and we're hoping to get the HoloLens 2 yeah. in the not too distant future, which does you know additional eye tracking and has a better field of view. Um, we've been working with Case Western Reserve. They have University. a lot of HoloLenses. Yep. <laughs> so um, we've actually been into their Interactive Commons is the name of the, the kind of the group or the area that has been doing some research into augmented reality. So we've been talking with them. We've actually hired in some of the students mm -hmm. from that program into Highland to continue our research. I know that they've recently deployed um, augmented reality in for students to into their cadaver lab where they don't need to use real bodies to help a cadaver teach, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to teach kids instead they can use these augmented reality headsets um, and they've been having pretty good success um, so I think that there are some some applications in the medical space for people um, not only students but physicians who need to like be able to use their hands but still see data there's also um, the ability, I forget what the actual concept is called in, in HoloLens, but it's like drop-in or something where somebody else can be kind of putting things into your field of while, view yeah, from while the you're outside working while yeah. you're working on it. So we see that being a very um, possible thing we could do. Um, yeah, so our, our research has really been there. Um, our most recent kind of project that we showed off at our Community Life um, conference, which is Highland's um, annual big conference. We actually did it in Cleveland. It'll be at the same building as the Blackland Conference. Okay. Um, Convention Center? Yep, yep. yep. And then um, this uh, next year in 2020, we'll be in Nashville. But we, we do a big Highland Labs booth, which is our Emerging Technologies um, Innovation Center of Excellence for Highland. And this past year, we had um, a combination of our share base engineers, so our cloud storage engineers, with our um, one of our interns build out uh, a roller coaster. It was like a Connects roller coaster that were the roller coast, right? Yeah, like, yeah. We like Cedar Point. Um, and That's so, what we're known for. We got <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're actually one, I believe they're one of our customers. I hope I can share that. Um, and so we built out this IoT roller coaster where um, Using an augmented reality headset, you'd see this overlay on the roller coaster, and there it would break down. And then we'd have the this triggered uh, an exception into our cloud platform that would then go through your hollow lens to tell you how to fix the roller coaster in real time using an augmented reality display to have you like go around the roller coaster to the appropriate place, fix the problem. This is using, you know, our, I think it was RFID sensors and, and other IoT related um, gadgets, if yeah. you will, um, pairing that with augmented reality to, um, and then using ShareBase as a backend engine in the cloud to, to manage the process of fixing this thing and logging what you've actually done to, to fix our IoT roller coaster using augmented reality. And again, we're just trying to, to learn, right? Like a big part of enterprise software, especially at our scale, is one of the 
the leaders in our market is making sure that we understand the technology mm -hmm. before it's adopted. We're the ones who want to create the adoption and define how it's going to be used. And to do that, you have to explore, you need to experiment, uh, you need to fail. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you, know, you just yeah. gotta try and see what sticks and work with people um, and show them what you're capable of and then they can bring the ideas of like, oh, okay, well maybe it's not a roller coaster, it's my healthcare equipment and I want to have this has been this has been my latest geek out thing I've been really engrossed in augmented reality so that's why I was as excited you should but, come um, to our lab you can I'm, come to Highland and I'm we'll coming. show you yeah we'll take show me you. over have you ever heard of Mirari it's a Mirari it's, mm -hmm. it's a company out of Detroit actually okay. um, and they have some affiliation with Team Neo uh, okay. over here so they, they've come over and I, I visited one of their uh, uh, setups in Michigan and it's great um, it's they have the goggle set up you look at like one of their um, examples is it you're looking at a car that's that's up and it will tell you like step-by-step -step instructions of what to pull up to change parts yeah. and as somebody that's not handy at all all of a sudden it's like the matrix like I can you change my oil to the next degree right and it's <laughs> but they have that they, they went over some healthcare yeah. applications but you know, some real high-level you know, yeah. disassemble this machine you've never seen before. Yeah. And it just, and it tells you like, oh, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Oh, you're doing it wrong. So we uh, we built a prototype yeah. like that where you would be looking at a, a map and then based off of mark recognition, it would tell you, you know, an HVAC system is like down and then we'd use CAD drawings to like, this is all in augmented reality, pop that out, break apart, here's the broken piece. You can order the new part through our system. Yeah, um, I so, love it. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Yeah, that's so what I'm been, into. Yeah, so we've been exploring, um, we've been exploring those things. But again, not from a, we're not ready to bring those types of things to market. I don't know that you know our industries are ready to adopt that at scale. Absolutely not. But again, yeah. So, but <laughs> the we, first time you screw up a surgery is, yeah. is the last time that anyone's using yeah. AR for a while. Uh, yeah. So, but we're very interested in it and continue to yeah to kind of explore that for sure. That's exciting. I, it's that's, really fun. Yeah, I, I really, I really am glad that we were able to take the conversation there. Yeah. Um, you know, as as Blockland's coming up, uh, December 9th, tenth, and eleventh, we've been doing a lot more blockchain things for as a support. But as soon as that's over, it's going to be all AR for a while. Yeah. 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 You actually mentioned, um, you know, three D printing, mm -hmm. and like we see that starting to be adopted or thought about in the healthcare space. Yeah. You know printing out bones or printing yeah. out different Hands, pieces. Yeah, so joints. even bringing augmented reality where it's like, you know, you could be storing these 3D objects in our system, viewing that through an augmented reality headset in physical space and seeing that like maybe overlaid on a patient and then right from that interface, you know, click, have that print out yeah. on a 3D printer. Uh, you know, our technology can back that type of system, and we've prototyped that out where ShareBase is storing your 3D models. You can view it in your augmented reality headset, have that printed over on your 3D printer. Um, there's uh, also on Case's campus ThinkBox, mm -hmm. um, which is a public access makerspace. If you're watching this and you're in the area, I would highly suggest you go check it out. They'll give you a tour. You can use all the machinery. You can use 3D printers, laser cutters. All and you don't have to be a Case student. You don't have to be a Case student. You just got to go. Um, so we've been talking with them. We got inspired to do some 3D printing research um, and some of the, you know, kind of funnier things that we've learned is, you know, people in the jewelry space are kind of interested in, yeah. well, could I be using augmented reality in the context of 3D printing? Oh, anyone that deals with metal, you yeah, know, so I think in the, in the 3D printing space, the people are most excited about these like valves for planes. Mm -hmm. And like, I went to a 3D printing conference and everyone was like, did you see that valve? And I'm like, <laughs> I guess it looks like a piece of metal to me, you know, and they're Sweet like, valve, though. change the world, like you know, the game right. <laughs> Sorry. No, absolutely. I, I like Team Fortress. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then like with 3D printing, when it comes to 3D printing, like living things, perhaps, obviously yeah. that's been completely shut down by the United States government. Yeah. But like the real world application of that is 3D printing uh, hairs for, for mm. hair loss. Okay. So as a man with a receding hairline, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking into this. We'll work on it. And um, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. The problem is that I think it's there. The technology is there. You just have to go not yeah. in the United States for it because the United States is worried about somebody cloning a person. Yeah. But I'm like, I don't want the whole me. Just the, I, just the hair. Bring the just hair the back. hair. Yeah. Just the hair. So. I think you got some years ahead of you. We'll You'll see. Okay. We'll, 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 we're going overseas. We're not waiting. <laughs> 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 but at any rate, it's, it's like when you look at a technology at face value, like, like blockchain or like mm -hmm. AI or 3D printing, you, I think you just see like the, 
like with 3D printing, you see the guys making D and D figures at Micro Center. Yeah. But you're not thinking about, you know, making 3D printing metal or mm -hmm. 3D printing like real like cast, you know, yeah. polymers. I mean, I, and I think like you know for amputees and stuff, mm -hmm. like people are being able to 3D print and get new, um, you know. Extremities. I'm dropping yeah. the word right now, but hands, like, arms, yeah, yeah, whatever. Tendons, yeah, elbows. like so they're prosthetics. There you go. Right. <laughs> so they're um, they're actually able to lower the cost of that and make them custom and mm -hmm. and be able to serve those more, um, serve a better market. So like, and that's really helping people. And you know, at this Hims conference I mentioned earlier, we saw a lot of that in the healthcare space. And and those sorts of things are really going to help people in the near term. It's not. I mean, we can play some D and D and print out the figures, but if we can help a kid who wouldn't Walk. typically be able to get yeah. the prosthetic they need because they're gonna outgrow it and it's just not cost justified. It's like, well, you could print your own. Yeah. Like that's a, a pretty cool world that, uh, you know, I wanna help bring online and Highland is a good avenue to, to do some yeah. of these things. We're definitely focused on business automation, software and content services, but it's a growing company that, you know, has our eyes on being, you know, as big as your Googles or Microsoft, it's like, well, we will need to expand and we have the resources, we have the skill, we have the knowledge, we have the passion. Um, so they're things that we're looking into for sure. Yeah, I'll be honest, I had no idea Highland did so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our core business is definitely down the yeah. business auto business automation workflow, yeah. um, but as we scale, we're always looking for opportunities and we definitely um, know it's important for us to understand these technologies, even if they don't have an application in our space. Um, yeah, no. Like I said, it's. I think it's. It was great for me too. You know, I've, I learned a lot. Yeah. So, uh, as I'm winding down this podcast, what do you want to plug? Um, just Blockland. Obviously, we'll be out there. We're a workshop sponsor. So, if you you want to come out and visit us, uh, we'll be at Blockland. We have a Highland booth. So I, I don't know our booth number off the top of my head, but we'll be at Blackland, come to our booth, come to our courses. We'll be talking more about off-chain storage. We'll get a little bit deeper into some hands-on coding with uh, Hyperledger fabric and how we're starting to leverage it. So I definitely want to plug that. And then just Highland in general, we're always looking for you know, the top talent um, all over the world, especially in the Ohio area. We want to hire all the, um, the brightest people in the world and um, so if you're interested, have a passion for technology and you know, haven't heard of Highland or even if you have, go look us up, we're always hiring and really we just want people to know about us, know yeah. that we're more than just you know, a 25 year old software company serving businesses, we're growing and there's a lot of opportunities for passionate people to join. So. That's, that's Bring your great. talents yeah. to us. For sure. I, I I mean, locally, especially in the Cleveland area, if you're thinking about relocating to Cleveland, super low cost of living. And every tech person that I've met that has come from Highland or is at Highland has always said great things about it. So, And they have a litany of awards that prove it. Yeah. So. And you definitely do not need to be a programmer. You know, we have all sorts of different well, roles. Well, it's a company. Yeah, yeah so. it's a company. <laughs> HR, but it helps when you got a passion for yeah. the tech side. So. For sure. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to uh, plug was also Blockland. So again, you know, if we haven't uh, beaten this horse dead yet, uh, we have a 20% off discount code that is FYD. Uh, you could enter that in any of the uh, parts of the Blockland site where you go to register. Uh, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to myself for sure, um, Jackie Sanders, who is on here. I'll have her um, contact info in the bio as well, uh, as well as links to Highlands uh, products, some of the things they're doing, and, and potentially a way to reach out to Scott. So. Yeah, and actually, is one more thing, as a workshop sponsor, we have, since you're talking about mm -hmm. discount codes, yeah. we're actually sponsoring a number of people that are interested in going to the workshops. So if you have a development background, interested in exploring blockchain, but don't have the means to attend the conference, it, we have limited numbers, but you know, you're welcome to reach out. We're, we're, we're sponsoring people. We'll get them into the conference, get their, their, uh, their knowledge up, so. Yeah, uh, you know, heckle somebody on LinkedIn, preferably somebody that's videoed right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll go from there, all right? Yeah, well thanks for having yeah, me on Thank the... you very much, awesome. I appreciate it, yeah. Great. Yep.